Bună seara și bine ați venit la Școala Digitală pentru ONG-uri. Eu sunt Mădelina Oprișan și voi fi gazda dumneavoastră în această seară. Sper că ne auziți cu toții foarte bine. Mă bucur că sunteți alături de noi în mijlocul lunii decembrie și mă bucur că mulți dintre dumneavoastră au participat la mai toate trainingurile pe care le-am organizat deja în cadrul școlii digitale. Să vă rog să-mi scuzați voce, sunt foarte răcită. Vă reamintesc că dacă uh, organizația care o reprezentați încă nu este membru în comunitatea Textu, vă așteptăm în scrierea dumneavoastră. Uh, poate profitați de vacanța care urmează și o să faceți această formalitate, cum spunem noi. Peste 1500 de organizații sunt deja membri în comunitate și visul nostru este să ajungem la cât mai multe uh, organizații non-profit din România. Așa că dacă știți ONG-uri interesate de tehnologie sau au nevoie de resurse de învățare, vă mulțumim foarte mult dacă le dați de veste și le spuneți despre, despre noi. Uh, revenind la întâlnirea din această seară, vă reamintesc că Școala Digitală pentru ONG-uri face parte din programul ONG Online, un proiect finanțat prin granturile SE 2009-2014 în cadrul fondului ONG în România. Pregătim deja cursurile online pentru anul viitor și abia așteptăm să vă dăm de veste, să revenim cu vești la începutul anul viitor. Să știți că regăsiți deja înregistrările webinarilor pe care le-am făcut, primele 5, în, pe contul nostru de YouTube. O să găsiți acolo un, am făcut deja o, un playlist special. Revenind la întâlnirea din această seară, mă bucur să-l avem alături de noi pe Chris Warman. Chris are o bogată experiență în strângere de fonduri, comunicare și marketing. A lucrat în diferite organizații non-profit din Statele Unite ale Americii, printre care și Special Olympics. A venit în România în 2011 ca voluntar Peace Corps în Odorheiu Secuiesc, unde a fondat prima fundație comunitară din țară, Fundația Comunitară Odorheiu Secuiesc. În prezent, Chris este Senior Director Alliance în Community Engagement în echipa globală TechSoup. Iar webinarul din această seară va fi în limba engleză. Vă rog să ne lăsați întrebările dumneavoastră pe chat, pentru că eu o să ne notez, atât eu cât și colega mea, Elena și Alexandra, sunt pe chat și o să ne le vom nota. Și la final o să avem o sesiune de întrebări și răspunsuri și o să fie mai ușor să se traducem în Chris. Um, Vă spun că sunt, suntem încântați că îl avem pe Chris alături de noi. Vă spuneam pu puțin mai devreme în proba tehnică. Uh, în acest moment Chris este în San Francisco, unde este ora uh, 6 dimineața. Okay. Sper că Chris ne aude și poate să intre în legătură cu noi. Chris, Chris ne auzi? Mm. Un moment. Chris? I'm, I think Hello. we can hear each other now. Yes. Hello. Hello, Chris. Can you hear us? You are live now. I can, and good morning. <laughs> For me. I'll make you now a presenter, so we'll be able to see your screen. I will put my, my microphone off, and we will be listening to you. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Super. All right. Well, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, as Madalena noted, it's 7 o'clock in the morning here. Nice little sunrise going on, some coffee. So I may not be my smartest self, but I will, I will certainly try. Um, by way of introduction, as Madalena said, uh, I started my fundraising career really with Special Olympics and then came to Romania in 2006 with Peace Corps, started the Community Foundation, and spent between 2006 and really January of this year in Eastern Europe, first in Romania and then the last two years in Poland, working on community philanthropy, later on technology, building up TechSoup Romania and being a part of the TechSoup Global Team. Um, over the years in Romania in particular, I worked with several hundred NGOs, uh, primarily in uh, Adeal and in Moldova, on fundraising and communications practice as I started the Community Foundation and shared the sorts of things that we were learning. So all of what I'm going to talk about here is based on work that uh, I did in Eastern Europe. It's based on work that I continue to do in the region as a teacher and trainer for several universities. It is 
the kind of thing that has been tested and it does work, something that I think is very important that you will notice is that all of this is based on communications practice. Very hard to raise money if nobody knows who you are. And the last thing I would note is that <clears throat> all of this takes time. Um, we, all of us need more money and more friends right now for our NGO, but it's never quite that simple. It takes a while to build up a brand, to build up a position, to help people understand who you are as an inevitable organization, someone that they must give money to, to make something positive happen in their community. So these things, again, they all happened, they're all, all real, and they all took some time to develop. So. I'm going to share some of what has worked and what I have worked with others to make work. And hopefully it will spur some good questions, some good ideas. Do ask questions, happy to answer them via email, happy to connect you with organizations who've actually applied this. We won't naturally have time to talk in detail about every single step of the process, but more an introduction on a way to get started, particularly from a communications perspective. Madalena noted that um, I started the Fundacia Comunitara in Odorje uh, back in 2007. <clears throat> that again was very much a developmental process. We started by asking a question. At the time, ARC, the Associazione Pentru Relazzi Comunitara, you know, the guys in Cluj, they'd started a discussion about community foundations. And they'd actually been to Odorje and decided that it wouldn't work there for political reasons. As a Peace Corps volunteer who was living there, I had a lot of opportunity to talk to people about the idea, would they be interested in a community foundation? Everyone sort of said yes, yes, but they didn't really believe that it would happen. Then I started asking people really, what, what was it that they thought was important? What was it that they thought mattered? And we did that by running a campaign, kind of like StoryCorps. You can look up StoryCorps online, where we asked people in Odorje, regular people, to tell stories. Tell me a story, tell me a memory, your favorite thing about Odorje from when you were a child, whatever comes to mind. And people told stories about public spaces, about sports events, about going to community events of different kinds, cleaning up the forest and picnics. And we started pulling out these stories about what really mattered. Again, a lot about public spaces and opportunities for children, sports, these sorts of things. We made their answers into a campaign. So we recorded all of their answers. We put them right back out to the community via uh, video in particular on YouTube. And we had a partnership with the local newspaper to put out kind of the story of the week, the memory of the week from people in the community. And this way, the community was telling the community what mattered. And all we had to do was put our logo at the end saying, you know, that's what a community foundation is for. We're here to make these things happen. We're here to work with you on making these things happen. So the community told the community what the problems were and we positioned as the potential solution. We used that then to, that really helped people see by telling themselves who we were, what we might do together. So it was a, a PR campaign essentially. Based on that, we started making giving very accessible and I'll get into some of these things later. Basically, we opened every possible way for people to give money that we that we could. 2%, the, you know, doyla su we had drop boxes, we launched something called the community card where when people went shopping they would scan a little card and the local supermarket would give 1% of their sale back to the community foundation, employee giving, events, basically everything we possibly could. Some of them were much more successful than others. The community card, employee giving went well, 2% was okay, but a lot of people were already getting 2%, very competitive space. and. Over the, over the years, so now in Otorje, this is a town of 36,000 people with 12,000 post boxes. We have 11,000 people participating, 11,000 donors to the community foundation. They're not giving very much money. You know, they're giving like three, four lei per month, sometimes a little bit more. Some, you know, certainly some of the local businessmen give more. But what, 
you know, if you think about that, essentially everyone in the community is giving. And it all really started by that communications campaign of asking what it was they cared about. Not asking them for money, but really trying to ask them what it was they found important, what they would want to work on, and then positioning as the solution to that problem. Based on that, I'm going to talk about a couple of things, and that's the sort of thing that I've modeled frequently around the region. Um, based on that, there are a few pieces that we really learned um, that I would challenge you to think about. Knowing your market, thinking about how you're going to build a communications empire to meet that market, and then some of the asking tips that we'll get into at the end, kind of various ways of asking both en masse and then individuals, actually asking for money. So to begin with, knowing your market, who are these people that we're actually trying to reach? I actually worked with a couple of sociologists and historians when I started uh, trying to figure out a community foundation. Sociologists in terms of how many people actually live in this town? What is their income? How have they been giving in the past? What are the demographics? You need to set realistic goals for your community and for your fundraising needs. If you have a big message, everyone in Romania should care about the trees, you know, the deforestation issues, that's a huge fundraising campaign. We in NGOs often assume that because we care, everyone cares. That's simply not true. Not everyone will give. You can at best, assume that maybe if you're really, really, really good, you could reach 80% of your possible donors. But that's, that's essentially market saturation. Within that, not all of them naturally will give the same thing. Uh, in the US, they say that about 20% of the donors give 80% of the money. So 20% of your people give the most of your money. That means 80% of your people aren't giving very much at all. So they're giving a little bit of money at a time. The question is, how can you make the cost to get that money from them very low? Through direct debit, through employee giving, some sort of automated system where over time, it may be expensive to set it up, but over time, you keep collecting money. It doesn't matter if it's only five lei. It doesn't matter if it's only three lei because it isn't costing you much to get it. You have a lot of people giving, that's fine. You've created a community. So, Knowing who your people are, knowing how much they can possibly give, just some basic numbers. You don't need to do a lot, but it will help you understand how much investment you should make and what kind of tools you might want to use. Maturity and message is just kind of about who you are. Knowing your market in terms of their ability to think about the kind of organization you are. Does everyone know you already? If they know you already and they aren't giving you money, why not? If they don't know you, you have to do a lot of work to actually build up your reputation, these sorts of things. So how many people are we actually talking about? How much can they actually give? And how ready are they to absorb what you're saying? The next thing, talking about kind of sociologists and historians, is knowing who they are from a cultural perspective. As I mentioned before, in the, um, <clears throat> when I was talking about the memory studio campaign, when we were asking people about their memories, it's easy to presume that we know what people care about, but don't, don't make the mistake of assuming you know what they care about. Ask them. I was working with a bunch of community foundations from Eastern Europe last spring in a workshop in uh, Czech Republic. And I asked, what, what do you think people actually care about in your community? You're walking down the street, and you meet a bunica, and you say to the bunica, hey, bunica, what do you actually care about? And somebody raised their hand, and they said, transparency. I said, come on, really? Transparency? I don't, that may be a very special bunica. I think, you know, I wish my grandma would have been that cool. Most people, most grandmothers aren't going to say transparency. They're going to say things like family, health, um, security, kind of the safety of a community, these sorts of things. So ask people what it is they actually care about. Listen to what they're saying. 
and also, very importantly, listen to how they're saying it. When people tell you what they care about in a community, what their values are about, you know, again, whatever topic it is, you can ask them the same question about, you know, what is important for children? What is important for environment? What is important? And ask them these questions about your particular topic. Listen to how they're telling you the answer back. Are they telling you stories? Are they telling you facts? Are they telling you impressions? What are the, how are they actually communicating? So culturally speaking, not only what do they value, but how are they talking about it? Because you can use those things they value. Are they making some sort of joke about shepherds? Are they making some sort of joke about, I don't know, whatever it happens to be, teachers? If they are, those might become useful campaign stories later. Those might become things that you can use. Put your message in their words. Easiest way to kind of hijack or pirate your way into the people's minds is by using the language that they use. So second question then, once you've heard their answer and once you've listened to how they're answering your question, you need to work on <clears throat> how you get to them through their friends. It's something that has become very apparent in sociological research recently, that we as NGOs can't simply tell people what to care about or why to care. People need to hear this from their friends. They need to see their friends change behaviors. People change behaviors according to research. I highly recommend a book called Social Physics by Alex Pentland, and I can you know, we can send this out in the notes later. He's been looking at how people change behaviors, especially social behaviors. People change behaviors because they see their friends change behaviors. So funny thing about communications is that we often think that it is about written word, it is about um, a story that we're telling. The best sort of communications is when friends are telling their peers and this will come up later in relationship to certain fundraising practices. So when friends are telling their peers, or even better, when people see their friends do something, the best kind of communications you can do about your work is setting up events, volunteer events, some sort of events where people see people like them participating in your mission. Again, we'll get back to that, but at the, at the end of the day, apparently this has played out across countries around the world in research, if people see their friends do something, they will start doing it too. Makes sense. Apparently we're all still teenagers. So last question on the cultural side is can you make people proud? Assuming you know how they're talking about things, assuming you figured out how to set up ways in which people are communicating to their friends, can you make it something that people are proud to be a part of? Can you make it something that is historical? Ask people at the local museum. Civil society has been around in Romania for a long time in one way, shape, or form. It has been there in local associacias for this and associacias for that, fundacias for this. Help people connect with a history that says people in this community have been philanthropic forever. People have been giving forever. In one way, shape, or form, run some PR around that get stories in the local newspaper, get that, that little moment from the historian where, you know, um, Nikolai, whomever, in 1904, set up this foundation where they did workers' rights. Believe me, it happened. Go find those so that you can communicate to people that what you're doing isn't new, it isn't crazy. It's just something that good people from this community have always taken care of themselves. It's just about being from here. We've always done this. Of course, during the socialist period, not so much maybe, but we're reconnecting with these roots about who we are, and it's a part of being a good citizen to do this. So listen to how they're talking. Make sure that this is a communicable campaign through networks, and you're showing people these sorts of things, and then couch it in history. It isn't new. New is scary for people. You don't want to be perceived that way. Focus on something that has always just been part of who you are. Oops. There we go. Finally, in the communication side, certainly thinking about 
how people consume media. If you've done all of your messaging and you've gotten this all wonderful and you put it in the wrong place, then you've lost. I had a very funny conversation one time with somebody who wanted to work on, man, bunikas are a big part of today's discussion. They wanted to work on elderly health in villages. And they said, Chris, I want to do this campaign to reach old people in villages. This was down in Bosnia, actually. And talk about health, talk about end of life care. Oh, fantastic. How are you going to do that? And they said, we're going to run a Facebook campaign. <sighs> I, you know, I don't know many bunikas in tiny villages in the Bosnian mountains who are on Facebook, considering they don't have the internet there. Maybe that's not the best idea if you're trying to reach them directly. On the other hand, their children are on Facebook because they all live down in Sarajevo. So if you want to reach their children to tell their grandparents, maybe you're right. Maybe cool. But think about how people are actually consuming messages. Everybody has channels that they listen to. Many times it is social media for certain generations. TV, radio, newspapers in a lot of villages, it's at the pub. I remember working in Erde and Ardeal and people got all of their news, at least the men, over a beer in the pub. The ladies were getting their news in the hair salon. Take your message where people are, in the words that they understand, and they will hear you. That gets to the point about form again. How are people giving right now? Philanthropy does happen in Romania. Philanthropy happens all over. People are giving to churches, they're giving to hospitals, they're giving to schools. People do give. How are they actually giving? Is it cash? Is it direct debit? These are things you need to be thinking about when you're trying to understand your market. What is the market for giving right now? Who are your competitors? The church, hospitals, schools. Is there a way to convert people? Are people already giving all of their money? I kind of doubt it. How are friends giving? Very important question that you can ask people just to raise the point. How, how do people in this community give? How are they giving? Because if they can identify that their friends are doing it, this gets back to the peer giving. Let them sell themselves on what you're trying to do. And then how can you fake it? Assuming you actually have to build a market for philanthropy. Assuming you're starting at almost scratch, not quite zero, but a little bit above zero, how can you fake this? And this is really that behavioral change point that I made earlier. People give because they see other people give. This is particularly true around sporting events, around, you know, think about the swimathons, for instance, that have become quite popular, marathons, these sorts of things. When people see that their peers are giving, it starts to look normative. It starts to look like something that is normal for people to do. People give at church for various reasons, but one of them is that everybody gives the church. Everybody sees everyone give. The physical act of giving money is clear and it is apparent. If people see it, they, they start to assume it as cultural. So setting up ways in which people can give that are visibly obvious that are, make it a communications campaign about the concept of giving, that teaches people about the concept of giving and whatever it is that you're actually trying to raise money for at the same time. Work on faking those things. So to recap, know your market, know the metaphors, know how they consume media, and know how they give and how they value giving. Basically know why they're giving, how they talk about it, know what they think is important, and then how you're going to put your message in that context. So assuming that you've figured this all out, and I'm sure you've all figured it all out already, <laughs> know who they are, values, communications. You have to build your communications machine. I would very much suggest, if you don't do it already, setting up a regular publishing schedule. When you have the stories, be it the historical stories, be it the um, stories about people giving right now, be it the success stories of your organization or impact stories, this is how we change someone's life 
I would definitely recommend that you do a class or you do take some time to think about the stories and storytelling. Uh, Christy Lupsha from Decatur Vista one time in a workshop was talking about how every child knows the elements of a good story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Once upon a time, one thing happened to one person and it was resolved like this happily ever after. And I thought that was a very good point. All of our stories can be very easily framed. Once upon a time, there was one person who interacted with the mission of your NGO. There was a resolution, positive, negative, you helped that person. Keeping those stories very, very small helps people contextualize your work. It helps them understand. A lot of what we do is very big and very scary. We're working against poverty, we're working against hunger, we're working with deforestation, huge, huge issues, and people won't necessarily be able to see themselves in that. If you're using their stories, their micro stories that go back to them, people begin to see that they can make a small difference. With TechSoup, when we were doing Restart Romania, we ran a campaign called uh, Little Heroes, with also with the Couture Vista, and the point was, Restart was asking people to think about designing web apps that would work on big issues, be it citizen engagement in budgeting, uh, that's kind of a hard story to tell, or be it around various kinds of education or activism. And we knew that there's a feeling, sort of this aceste feeling, that life is very big, these things have always been this way, it's very hard for any one of us to make a difference. So again, working with De Couture Vista, we ran this campaign to identify times when real people had actually changed Romania. One person had made a difference. And I remember this one story that was about a person, a father, a new father, who before he became a father, he hadn't really cared about, about what was going on his, in his community. Then he had his son. And when he had his son, he started looking around and seeing the problems and just thinking this isn't good enough this isn't good enough for my kid and he started writing a letter every night to the mayor in his uh, particular district and he wrote a letter and he wrote a letter and he wrote a letter and finally the mayor wrote back and said yeah you know we'll take care of it if you just shut up right <laughs> so one person had managed to make a difference and you need to be able to put your sort of storytelling in the same context so that people can associate it, so that they can see somebody from my community did this, I can do it too. Put it very much in context and again, make them the story. Your organization's mission is only as alive as people understanding it. So show that people understand it, show that people are engaging in it. And ultimately, you know, again, if you're building these well, show that they're giving in particular ways show the actual philanthropy side of this so that other people can really model it. And then share it everywhere. Well, I, you know, that may sound like a little bit of a contradiction to what I said about, um, you know, using Facebook to reach bunikas. Make sure that you are sharing your story in as many channels as you possibly can. Set up an email newsletter. Set up a social stream, use Facebook, use Twitter, use any media that you can possibly get. Make sure that you've got this in video. Make sure that you're asking people to tell their own story whatever way they can, citizen journalism. You have to get your message out as broadly as possible to as many people who might be interested as possible. You never really know where that next donor is going to come from, but I promise you, if they haven't heard about you, they won't give. So do share your stories, your regular stories, your day-to-day -day communications as broadly as possible. Targeted, very specific campaign things, you know, again, maybe with the bunikas in the village, you want to tailor the actual point. But even there, any stories that come out, don't make sure people know you're trying. Make sure people know what you're doing. Make sure that people know if you've succeeded or not. Ultimately, you want everyone in a particular community to make a positive association between who you are and what you're trying to do. If you say environmental activism in, in kind of CSR or foundation or NGO spaces in general, everyone says Greenpeace. 
disaster relief, Red Cross. You want to get to the point where everyone just makes an automatic association between whatever it is you're trying to solve and your organization's brand name. If they are telling their friends, if they are making your audience is making that association, then clearly they trust you enough to use you as an example. They trust you as the example in that particular topic. Nice position to be in if you're ready to start asking for money. Pardon me, a little sip of coffee. So, once you've captured their imagination, and once everyone's using you as an example, we can start moving along to the question about asking. And if they don't know who you are, they don't show that they trust who you are by recognizing your brand, don't ask them for money. None of us give money to people that, well, I was going to say none of us give money to people we don't trust, but I'm sure that we do. I don't necessarily know that I trust some of the people I buy things from, but <clears throat> I think you get my point. That if people don't know who you are, they're not likely to, certainly out of the blue, give you money. Which brings us to this question about what, what makes a good fundraiser. Assuming we've done our communications work, what, what do we learn from the actual people who are the best fundraisers in the world? Beggars, businessmen, and priests. What makes these people good fundraisers? They each clearly have a different value proposition, but it's a very clear value proposition. Beggars, you know, give me some money right now for me. And maybe this will assuage, this will sort of help you a little bit with some of your guilt. Maybe. Or maybe it's just like, get out of my face, you know, here's some money. Um, not necessarily a positive value proposition, but it's pretty clear. Give me some money, I'll leave you alone. Businessmen, they've got a very particular value proposition. Give me some money and I'm investing this in you. I'm investing this in the future. This money, this deferred, grad, this deferred return on investment is going to help you some time. Nothing personal, it's business. Nothing emotional, it's business. It's just good for you later. Priests. Priests have a very particular return as well, which is about the social, it's about um, you know, your soul, it's about the future of you and your family, and a much more emotionally based ask than businessmen naturally, but also an investment. So what, what again can we learn from these people? One of them is that each of their value propositions is quite clear how they are asking tends to be quite clear. Each of them also has a high level of frequency. They're asking all the time. Businessmen aren't asking me for money all the time, I suppose, because I work in an NGO, but I know that they're asking other people for money. So these people are asking all the time, and they're very comfortable. They're very well practiced at asking. There's an immediacy in their ask. They're not talking about give me money sometime. They're talking about give me money now for whatever it happens to be. They're personalized in their ask. They're not talking about other people. They're not talking about whomever. They're talking about you give money. You give me money for this thing. So they are connecting with you as an individual, not just sort of everyone. And they tend to make it very easy they tend to make it very easy to give. The actual giving mechanism is very apparent in their ask. So put it in my hand, put it in the bowl, put it in the bank account. The actual ease of giving becomes quite easy. So each of these is very clear. They're very good at it because they practice all the time. They're talking to you, not everyone, and it's easy to give. Naturally, when we think about these sorts of people, um, I know that a lot of NGOs that I've worked with over the years feel a little bit more like a beggar. I promise you that if you want to earn money, you have got to overcome that. What we do as NGOs, what we do in helping the world with its problems is very important and empowering stuff. You have to understand that and believe that for yourself. 
you have to know the impact you're making, you have to know the stories that you're telling, and understand that they are making a difference, or people will never trust you. Because ultimately, we're a little bit of a blend between businessmen and priests. <clears throat> what we're asking people to invest in is not exactly a return to me. If I give money to your NGO, I'm not getting it back. So I'm not really a businessman, but it is an investment in the future of this community. It is an investment in health. It is an investment in the forest. It's an investment in whatever, which is largely an investment in my family's future, my family's security, my community's security. There is an investment element that is similar to a businessman, but it's also a little bit like a priest because we're asking people to have faith. We're asking people to believe that this investment will have a beautiful return. We're asking them to believe that we can do something good when a lot of the media and a lot of the world is pretty convinced that doing good, actually making things better, is hard if not impossible. So we end up, in the best case scenario, helping people understand what we understand and asking them to invest in a way that does have a positive return, but a positive social return. So again, somewhere between a businessman and a priest. It's a faith-based discussion in certain ways, this values-based discussion. Definitely not beggars. If you feel like a beggar, then you need to reconnect with the story and look at the people that you're actually serving and take pride in the fact that you are doing something really wonderful and that you're asking people to be a part of that as well. When you figured out your own position, and this is something that, again, there are ways to get trained on that. Uh, we'll talk about some asking techniques in a little bit here, but certainly something to focus on a lot is your own comfort in telling your story, your own comfort in communicating and asking, your comfort in your organization's uh, ability to do that do make sure that you have a very clear value proposition, meaning if you give us this money, then what? Make it very, very easy for people to understand what your proposition is. Not One thing that you definitely see sometimes in NGO communications is a huge value proposition. So if you give us money, we're going to end poverty. We're going to solve this horrible issue with a disease. If you give us this, then we're totally going to change the world. That's a pricing question. If you're telling people that for five ron they can change the world, they're not really going to believe you. That also will often lead them to feel dissociated with the ask. It makes them feel un really disempowered. Oh, you know, I want to help change the world. I want to save all the forests, but I can't, I can't give that much money. So if I can only give five ron, and I've got this cognitive dissonance, I realize that five or ten lei isn't going to save every tree in Romania. Why would I even give? You know, I just don't feel good now about my potential to influence this wonderful thing that I want. And you've lost a donor. So you need to make sure that your pricing makes sense. This little thing that you're going to do will contribute to exactly this. 10 lei means what? 20 lei means what? Something real. We ran a very successful Dropbox campaign in Odorhe where we put the, we asked people to give bani, 10 bani, 20 bani, 50 bani, whatever they had to help renovate playgrounds. And in the visual marketing, we had a poster campaign where you could see people dropping coins in the boxes, and then thanks to some Photoshop that was probably worse than I remember, as the coins passed into the box, they magically transformed into things like nails and hammers and paint. Very simple, tangible items. And visually, the message was clear. If you give 50 Bonnie, if you give these things, it's not going to change the world but it will contribute to a very direct output. Help people see that and understand that so that they can see, again, themselves. This keeps coming up. They can see themselves and their contribution in context. Then, as I have said before, you know, when you're talking about 
about selling, how are you making that communicative and communicable? Meaning, how are you showing people? How are you helping people share this message? And even if, as you're designing your kind of communications campaign empire and you figured all this stuff out, even if you fail to make money, have you figured out how to make this a good story so that you're at least educating people? The, one of the most outstanding failures we had with the Community Foundation was a Christmas card campaign. After we'd done our first playground renovations, with the help of that money that people were dropping into boxes, we decided that we would run a Christmas card campaign to have children design Christmas cards, so an art competition. A local printing company would print those cards, and then we would sell the cards back to the community. Printing company donates the cards, local supermarket gives us perfect placement at the checkout line, local newspaper and radio are talking about it, the children are designing cards to make better playgrounds for children. This is a perfect, on a philosophical level, communications campaign with great product placement. What could go wrong? We made about 8,000 cards, and we sold in the end about, um, I feel like there were about 200. And of those 200, I probably bought 50, mostly from my friends and family. Utter failure in the actual fundraising side of things. Why? Halfway through the campaign, when it's obviously not going well, I start talking to my friends in Odorhe and I say, oh, come on, why isn't anybody buying Christmas cards? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we heard about that. That's a wonderful campaign. You know, it's great that we're fixing playgrounds, but you know, in Odorhe, no one buys Christmas cards. Great. So, we had a perfect campaign. People understood the story. We totally failed to make any money, but we'd educated people. We failed because we hadn't asked people. We hadn't talked to people about what they actually wanted, what they actually valued around Christmas time. So, again, even if you fail to make money, make sure that whatever you're actually selling is told in a good way so that eh, you didn't make any money, but people understood the point, you get a little bit further. On the upside, even today, if you get a thank you card from the Odorhe Foundation, any time of year, it could be August, it could be May, it doesn't matter, it's your birthday, it still says Merry Christmas. We have a lot of those cards. So. How do you ask lots and lots of people? There are plenty of ways that are actually working right now across Eastern Europe in fundraising for the masses. As I mentioned earlier, sports events, so swimathons, marathons, these sorts of events where people are asking their friends. It's a great way to do marketing. Again, um, the peer marketing being important because people trust their friends in ways that they probably don't trust you as an organization or civil society in general. Let people's friends be your vector. Let them be your communications channel. Cause-related marketing campaigns. This is, uh, you know, some of the banks have been doing this. I also brought up the uh, key card earlier where people, uh, the community card, where you're buying something, it's tied to a product, it's tied to an actual sale, and you're getting a small percentage. Um, you're going where people are already buying anyway and taking a little bit of the revenue of that sale. It's also important because it opens a door. You're not gonna get a lot of money necessarily, but you're exposing your brand and you're bringing them into giving around something they're already doing. Employee giving, certainly. Um, this is a mechanism that works quite well in Romania where people can redirect a piece of their salary every month to an organization. They have to fill out a form, but it makes it very easy and very repetitive. Like with direct debit, the best kind of fundraising you can, give, you can do is the kind where you don't have to ask and you don't have to ask often. Once people sign that form, the money is given automatically. They often forget about the money that they're giving which puts you in a very nice position as a fundraiser to send a thank you note. Hey, thanks for giving. We did this thing with your money. That gets really exciting to people. Oh, I, 
kind of forgotten. That's great. Thank you for reminding me. It's a very positive feeling. They don't feel any pain of giving, unlike when people have to reach into their pockets all the time. When people have to reach into their pockets all the time, the research that I've seen on that is like once a year you ask for money, they tend to give for three years, whereas with something like direct debit or employee giving where it's happening automatically and they feel good about it, they tend to give for nine years. One of those is certainly better than the other. So Dropboxes, again, they're a fantastic communications tool. If you've got a good poster to go with your Dropbox, if you've got a good image on your Dropbox, and you can really connect people to what that difference is that 50 Bonnie actually makes, it's there. It's in the checkout line. It's in the shop. It's in the airport. It's wherever. It's good branding, whether or not it raises a hell of a lot of money. Though, certainly, every time I go through the airport in Bucharest, I'm surprised at how much money is in those things. So there's a high traffic frequency there that will lead to some money. It's also very easy. Tax redirection, the doy la suta. Now, of course, that's very competitive these days. Um, lots of people in that space, but there is a tax control element there. Events, lots of people giving through events. Online and mobile, getting better, getting more accessible. Um, certainly doesn't work if people don't really know who you are. And then donor circles. What you see across all of these is a lot about how obvious it is. It, none of this is very private giving. It's very public giving in a certain kind of way. It's certainly, you know, something like an employee giving. At the beginning, you've got to get a lot of employees in a room together to talk to them about filling out this form. It becomes a community activity. Those things become self-feeding. They become very organic over time <clears throat> as people get thank you letters from you as they get informed through your email marketing or whatever about the wonderful things that you're doing with their money, they start talking to their friends. They see their friends do it, they start talking to their friends. The more they do, the more it validates your position and you can grow. So again, many, many ways and I've written various articles about these different processes, kind of how-tos based on what we've done. We're happy to introduce you to people who have done these things. If you want to send a note uh, at the end of the webinar, there is a lot of information. Try as many as you possibly can. See what works for your community of donors. So just to recap again, peer networks, community ease and immediacy. Make it all very easy. Ask early, ask often. Churches ask 52 times a year minimum. There's a reason why they make money. Ask as easily and as frequently and in as visible a way as you possibly can. Even better, get people's peers to do it. <coughs> at the end of the day, too, and this is something I said at the beginning, start small, test these things. Don't assume what's going to work. Talk to people about the messaging and work your way up. Greenpeace did not get to be Greenpeace because they told people that saving the environment was the best thing to do in a very mega way. They were on the streets. They're out there with clipboards in hand building donor databases. They're standing there, and I'm sure TechSoup in Romania could probably talk to you about donor databases and different sort of CRMs, um, the relationship management tools that are out there. You have to collect names. You can't just assume this is going to be an immediate overnight kind of thing. In Odorhe, it took three years to get to the point where everybody just naturally associated what we were doing with positive outcomes and started just handing us money. Three years. Three years of testing all these different things. And like with the Christmas cards, sometimes failing. To one of the things that I wanted to essentially start closing with is one reason the Christmas cards were not a an complete and utter horrible failure was that the Christmas cards were donated. Everything in that was donated. So how do you mitigate risk? How do you build alliances and reduce barriers to success? How do you make sure that you're not likely to fail? One thing is certainly to make all of this as cheap as possible. You want access to big communities. You want to be able to talk to all the employees at a company about an employee giving campaign. 
you don't do that by walking up to the front desk and asking the secretary if you can talk to all the people. You have to work with influential people to open markets for you and reduce some of those barriers. So how do you go to a power broker, a big boss, chef about whatever, and get their alliance to join? One thing is definitely, again, having your story. Make If they know who you are before you get there, if they understand your value proposition as an organization, your mission before you get there, it certainly helps. That can't always happen, but all of those communications campaigns we talked about at the beginning, if those are in the media, if they're in the news, then people will have some understanding about who you are. Make sure that you send them some information before you go to a meeting. Prepare them for the wonderful information that you're about to give. They may or may not read it. Once you do get in the room, there's a certain series of questions that I, and this is really about where we're going to end, that I found very, oh, I guess we've got 10 minutes. There's a very useful series of questions when you're dealing with someone who is influential, who is powerful, who has um, a certain something to offer you that is not necessarily money, but probably more influence. These questions asked this way have personally worked for me every time, and um, they've worked for everyone that I've trained. So <clears throat> you go in and you tell your story. Keep it very short. Keep it very personal. This one time, this one person did this with our organization. They changed in this way. We were able to help them in this way. This is one success framed as one change. That's something that I can associate with. Anyone can associate with as a human being. Make that very, very short. Again, do some work on your story. Less than two minutes. This one time, this one person, this one change, that's what we're trying to do. That is what our mission looks like in human terms. And then what we're trying to do now is build to this next level. So that's what we do. This is where we're going. Where we're going is we want to launch this campaign to build out this program. We want to build a new hospital. We want to do whatever. Now they understand what your impact means and where you are trying to go. And then ask them. At all of that, best case, under two minutes, three at the max. Ask them, so what do you think? Do you think this is a good idea? And stop talking. Even if they don't necessarily think it is a good idea, very few people, and they're really cold-hearted, horrible people, will actually look at you and say, that's a horrible idea. Nobody says that. They say, yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. Again, they may not actually believe it, but once they say it's a good idea, you can bring this back to them later. If the conversation goes off track, you can say, well, I know that you think this is a good idea, so, so they validated your position. And then you ask them, what do you think might make this better? How could we make this idea better? This is a very interesting question because it shows respect for their authority. <laughs> it shows respect for who they are and the power that they've built. They might not have any idea. They might not have anything to add, but if you ask them and then you stop talking, things get uncomfortable, they will start talking, what might make this better? When they do, they've started contributing to who you are. They've started becoming a part of your mission. Do you think this is a good idea? Yes. How can we make it better? Listen to what they have to say and thank them. Huh, thank you. They may be crazy. It might not be a good idea that they had, but thank them for it and then move on. Okay, so that thank you for that. Who else might be interested? You know, who else do you know? People are very quick to show off their, their influence show their network. Oh, so and 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 so. These people want to do this. Cool. They have just given you a database. They've just handed you a lead list, a list, a list, a piece of people leads because it's in context. Ask if they can introduce you. This is very important because you can't introduce yourself to these people. It's no good if they just hand you a phone number. You can't pick up the phone the way they can. So Will you introduce me to that person? The list will become shorter. 
they may have just told you 50 people, now it's probably going to be five. But those are the five that A, again, are in context, they're ones who might care, and B, if they will make that introduction, then this is peer-to-peer -peer marketing. Again, they are comparing you to their friends. They're bringing you as a validated value proposition to their friends. Thank them. Make sure that you've written down those names and that you will remind them that you will follow up on that introduction. This is a good point to say, you know, I really appreciate all of that, and I just, yeah, we're excited to do this. Let them know that even if they don't actually follow through, you are going to do this anyway. It's a really important point because it absolves them of any guilt. It basically says, fine, we can move on now. So that you can go to the question about how they would like to be involved. So what is it that they could do beyond that, beyond an introduction? So this is where you can start talking about money. This conversation is best played out at once, but it can sometimes take time. How would you like to be involved? Is it a little bit of money or is it a lot of money? Give them a range. Is it not about money at all? It's about an article in the newspaper. It's about access to their employees. <clears throat> Whatever you can do to help them think about a range of options, let them choose. So again, they've validated your position. They've told you a way to make it better, so they're investing in you with their ideas. They've given you people that you can go to next, and you have a path forward on the way out. Be sure you follow up. Be sure that you have contracts as ready as possible. Whatever you need to do, whatever it is you're trying to sign, make it easy for them to sign. And then, no matter if you do one of the mass giving events, like a swimathon, or if you do this sort of thing where you're really trying to target a high-end individual, always, always, always report back. Be sure that you're sharing people, <clears throat> be sure that you're building trust with people in telling them the impact of their investment. You gave us this, we did this. It doesn't matter if they gave you one RON or one million RON, always tell them what you did with their money. This way they'll keep coming back, they'll tell their friends, they feel like they're part of something good, and you can move on. So, to recap the whole thing, and I realize that's been like a whirlwind tour through some communications and fundraising basics, know who you're asking and make sure that your values are in alignment with theirs. Make sure that you know what they value and that you are helping them understand that you are a solution to their value set. If they don't, they won't give you money Make sure that they know who you are, they're able to say who you are even better, and make sure that everyone is um, giving in ways that others see, that communal aspect, that peer-to-peer -peer giving, all of these sorts of things. Ask in a way that is respectful. Ask at, like that business priest, the person who is offering an investment in community and future, and then thank them a lot. With all of that, do your research, test your messaging, test it with your friends and their networks, capture their feedback, reflect on it, try it again. Test it, build it, test it, build it, move it up a level so you started with your friends, move out to the next group of people, capture their reflection, thank them, repeat it. Testing and repeating these things is what's gonna teach you which tools are the ones that will make you the most money which communications are the ones that are the most successful. So, that's about it. Um, happy to answer any questions, you know, do send emails, I'll provide relevant examples and how-tos. Always happy to do so because, well, I guess because it's Christmas, so, you know, cartoon better cheap and all that good jazz. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have more time, we have some questions. So, a few questions. Um, what about uh, chat strategy? Uh, uh, VRL from Red C uh, Cross asks us um, what if it is okay to use a um, strategy on um, micro channels like SMS, uh, SMS or WhatsApp, or or it is better to go for a broad um, audience. So, what do you think about 
uh, chat strategies? Sure. Well, we certainly use that not as a, you know, the way we look at that is more like forums and micro communities. Um, you know, the, those tools, uh, the chat tools that were mentioned certainly <coughs> can be effective in the sense that many people are there, but not necessarily effective as a broadcast process. So like you trying to get a message out to a lot of people, whereas if they are setting up their own discussion groups, kind of like old school chat boards, if you've got a group of teachers who's excited to do this thing, and you can introduce them to more teachers who are excited to do this thing, and you can create micro communities that are using those and then capture that information, capture their stories, share it out to build communities that are there, the ones that are talking to each other about what you're trying to solve. For us, that's been very effective. Um, we haven't necessarily found it to be effective in terms of like trying to get everybody talking about something, but micro communities are amazing because they tend to be very motivated. It's that one librarian who really cares, great, give them a platform, empower them to be, actually start building community. That can work really well. Thank you. Uh, you, can't, you can't scale that, right? I guess that's where we've come down. Like you cannot scale micro discussions. No one has enough time. So let them lead the discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Viral has, uh, has another question. Uh, how to transform facts uh, in values for an uh, organization? For example, he, he said that, okay, um, his fundraising strategy is based on the fact that, okay, you give me five lay and I will save five children, but uh, the children are a fact. So how can you, can we transform the, the value from facts to, um, to a higher purpose? Sure. I guess I always, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer this exactly correctly, but we, you know, in my experience, leading with the story and then backing it up with facts, using those numbers to justify the point. So we're trying to save five children. Those children are facts. Those children are real. That's all very true, but what does that actually mean in numeric terms? Are there statistics? Are there numbers? Are there hard facts that you can contribute to that. The children aren't the fact. What you're doing, how that will change the world, what does their five lay mean, it means this. Five lay for five children, that just seems like a crazy value proposition to um, begin with, but five lay, what is the fact that that will influence on one child's life? So I would, you know, I definitely, suggest that you couch and you surround your value proposition in clear facts, very clear numbers. Often the smaller the better. If I can understand my five lay does this, it's not, it's not going to save five children. I know that. But my five lay will provide one lunch. And there are a hundred other people who are doing that. That's a hundred lunches. I'm, I'm part of something. Okay. Fact. So, do, do use facts, but use them in ways that are very clearly associating me as the donor with my amount of money and the particular output that it's going to have, which then contributes to the larger value set. So the values come at the beginning and the values come at the end. The pathway can be all about facts. Logic. It needs to have a clear logic. Thank you. Uh, we will talk about that. Uh, maybe Viral has um, more questions. We will talk on uh, on email. Uh, we'll answer to that question. We have another question I wanted to to ask. What about what about um, for, um, NGOs who ha who are watching uh, who are who are no. <laughs> What about the um, non-profit organizations who act as uh, watchdogs or have difficulties in uh, fundraising for difficult causes, if you can say that, like human rights or justice? What, what, what is your advice on this? It's a hard space, uh, very definitely. You know, it's not a mass fundraising space often. Um, <clears throat> That said, Greenpeace, 
amazing, Amnesty International, amazing. They've developed a large fundraising base. They've helped people see <laughs> that these causes that are a little bit bigger and longer are accessible to donors. Um, that is a space where you're often going to be dealing with a little bit higher level individual donor and cultivating higher level donors. It's not easy for um, human rights activist groups to connect with regular people because most regular people don't appreciate the immediacy of a threat to democracy. It's a very meta discussion. It's a very big discussion. Like, if the government in Romania changes a rule right now that has something to do with sheepdogs, what is that? Oh wait, that actually happened in it. Uh, um, so like, what is it? What does that actually mean to me as a threat to my ability to do my daily business and be a regular happy person? That's a. It's a very hard logical connection for most people to understand, even though it may be true. As someone who believes very deeply in human rights and social justice, it's not an easy sell you often find you're often going to have to deal with more of the old school intelligentsia and work your way, like figure out who the, the one ratios of the world are. Those people who have that theoretical mindset and work with their communities, they tend to be high-end donors. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a harder path that way. But again, once in a while, you can build out a campaign around that. You can figure out ways to actually talk about these things that do track, trickle out to mass fundraising. Look at what Amnesty does. Look at what those other people do. It's difficult to compete with starving children if you're trying to deal with prisoners' rights because nobody likes prisoners, but it isn't impossible. There are people that have done it. I would look at how they've done it. And again, it tends to be they started with a group of high-end donors and then once in a while were able to find that story that made a good campaign for everybody. Not easy. But they're out there. People are out there. You have an advocacy issue to break down that big problem into smaller digestible campaigns. Thank you. I hope we answered the question. It's very useful. Uh, I have another question. Uh, what about the non-profit organization who work, um, let's say, they don't have a vital outcomes? So, in terms of someone who asks uh, ask us, um, what about, um, uh, they are trying to raise money, and the people are saying, I don't want to, to donate money for literature or poetry, I prefer to donate money for the kids. So, how will you compete mm -hmm. with that? Um, again, it's kind of like the amnesty issue. Remember earlier I used the term immediacy. What is the immediacy of poetry? I, before Special Olympics, I was on um, my, actually, my first fundraising campaign was my biggest. It was with the Guthrie Theater, and we were building a new theater, a $140 million project. That was a lot of money to raise, and we did it in a lot of small gifts. How do you make that story about the arts, a sexy, immediate story. It's really, <clears throat> it is a hard one because it's not immediate usually. What is the way to present culture and preserving culture or building culture as immediate? We have got to do this right now for the children. That's a hard sell. It's a hard logical connection because if I don't read a poem today, I can still go to bed with a full tummy. I can be, I'm not hungry. Poetry isn't feeding me. Yes, difficult. That is a challenge. Then don't try to do it that way. Don't try to compete in regular fundraising terms. Look at other ways in which you can fundraise. Can you do something to say, can you run a poetry competition that will generate the next best poet in Romania? Can you build out um, and then use that, sell that in a way. Can you create a digest of up-and-coming Romanian poets? Well, people in Romania may not necessarily want to give money right now to support um, your poetry session. I have, and this is a true story, when I left Romania, three different Romanians gave me books of Romanian poetry. I have never once in my life said that I like poetry. Why do they give me these books of poetry? 
clearly Romanians have a connection to poetry. Good. Is that something you can use? Look at other ways to capitalize on the resource that is that you're generating, which is the poetry, not net or the culture, whatever that happens to be. Performances where people are buying tickets, other ways of fundraising than simply asking for money to support the program. Because that program isn't as immediate and it will not compete with something like putting food in a belly. So that's part of the market question that we started with, right? Know your market. Um, I have I have to go, unfortunately, okay. um, but do, you know, again, happy to answer these questions over email, everyone, and I, I'm, I'm very sorry I have to run, uh, but well, my day is starting for real. <laughs> yeah, no worry. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you for your time and the passion and everything that you've done for, for us today. Thank you. And we will talk online. My pleasure. Mm. Thank you. Uh, All right. So thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Vă mulțumim. Îmi cer scuze, am o voce absolut îngrozitoare în acest moment. Vă mulțumim foarte mult că ați fost alături de noi. Ne revedem anul viitor cu noi cursuri online. Nu uitați că o să, o să găsiți aceste cursuri și pe contul nostru de YouTube. Am lăsat niște întrebări de pentru feedback, în formular de feedback de la final. Mulțumim foarte mult și ne revedem, ne revedem online. Mulțumesc, seara bună! Mulțumesc!